This week we are going to do another urn and it's going to be very similar to the one that I did in red. This is some of that fabulous box older burl but it is way past its prime. So this is going to be the last of three urns that I'm making for Troy. This is going to be the, the top, so that's why I've already got these cut out. These have been sitting around waiting for casting for a while. I figured that I would shoot a video on it. Um, everything's been cleaned up. I just used a wire brush. There wasn't really a whole lot to do. But we are going to have to put these in the vacuum chamber because uh, these are well past their prime. So let's get some epoxy mixed up and we will go from there. This week we're going to be using Designer Epoxy's Deep Casting Epoxy. Uh, because of the depth of this, you have to use a deep casting epoxy. If you try to use anything else, then for sure you're probably going to get some thermal cracking. The great thing about this, it has a really long set time, so that allows that resin to penetrate the wood, essentially stabilizing it, or nearly stabilizing it, and it's the best choice for this. All right, so this is going to be our top. So I'm going to put this in top down, get some shims too. Lots of great suggestions on naming my rock. Ultimately, I think I'm going to go with Dwayne. Dwayne the Rock Johnson, a uh, famous actor and wrestler. Uh, so anyway, that's what we're going to call the rock from now on. Mr. Dwayne, lots of respect for Mr. Johnson. All right, that should keep that from lifting. And the rock will keep that from lifting. It always surprises me how much weight it takes to hold pieces like this down uh, when they start to float. All right, let's get uh, both of these pieces in the vacuum chamber and then we will fill them. That way we don't have any spills putting them in and we'll get a vacuum on this. I am sure that this is not gonna be enough, but uh, we'll start here and see how much more we need. Yeah, it'll definitely take probably another one. All right, so here's another 650, or no, 600 milliliters, I should say. It would be nice to have a deeper bucket because this no doubt is going to uh, we're going to see a lot of air come out of this piece, but this is pretty much the perfect size, so that's why I'm sticking with this. Hmm. Can it be done, he says. All right, so I am sure that I'm going to have to mix up some more, So, uh, but it's going to be surprising how much this drops off if you haven't seen me uh, work with this box of burl yet. All right, let's get a vacuum on it. I just realized that I'm not going to be able to get the lid on because this is too tall. <sighs> okay. Looks like I'll have to tape it too. Back in a second. There, it's still going to need a weight on it because it still wants to go down a little ways, but that will serve our purpose for now. If this is the first time you watching anybody use a vacuum chamber, uh, this box elder burl has got a fair bit of dry rod in it, and it never, you know, it, it amazes me how much air comes out of this. So that's why it's important to do this step before we go forward with anything else. Up until now, I haven't been able to pull a vacuum on it, like a full vacuum, because it's going to over overflow here. And loosen it off again. I've just mixed up more epoxy and I want to take the any air out of it so I can just pour it on when we're done here. Just watch that epoxy down there. When you use the, the, um, the paddle in the drill, it really creates a lot of air. So keep that in mind when you're mixing up epoxy. The resin level has already dropped below the, uh, the urn blank.
Look at the bubbles coming out of that epoxy that I mixed up. Alright, so this has been under vacuum for an hour. Uh, let's release it and top both of these up. And then I'll put it under vacuum again for another hour or so. The little top is fine. We'll leave the rest of this for later after this because this will still go down. It's always best to make sure that the wood is submerged when you're doing this. If it isn't submerged in the resin, then of course the resin can't uh, be drawn into it. So as we watch this cycle on and off and be amazed at how much air comes out of this blank, you know, I'm a firm believer that I've got enough time and experience under my belt doing resin casting now that, you know, this is the way to go. Throw things in the vacuum chamber, unless it's a really solid piece of wood, and then into the pressure pot afterwards. Uh, the combination of the two will give you the best casting that you can get. All right, well, that's been two hours, so it um, doesn't look to be much more air coming out of it. Let's release the vacuum and see how far this level drops off. I see some floaties. Nobody wants floaties. I think that I pretty much got the right amount of resin here. Just top this up. And I will throw this in the pressure pot. And we will see you guys in 72 hours. All right, so we are out of the pressure pot and it's been something like six days. I uh, haven't had a real huge need for this, so let's see what we're looking at. That wasn't too bad. There's where the second pour came to right here. So, you know, I'm not, I'm always worried about witness lines, but in this piece, there's no like major voids where, you know, you're going to see the first pour and the second pour. I just basically needed this to make sure that the back end of this burl here is stable enough that we can grab it with the, with the jaws from the chuck. Um, that way it's nice and stable. All right, let's get our centers and get this on the lathe. I checked on it on this piece a day after it was cast in the pressure pot and I noticed that the level had dropped off. So that's why there is a second pour. And um, I just was really worried that I needed the back end of this piece to be good and solid so I could hold it with the chuck. Here I'm just showing that I drilled down to wood. That way uh, we're not relying on the resin when it's pinched between centers. Like it does almost every week, we're going to use the Hercules here. This is the, the main tool that I use for working with resin. And of course, if you want any of the Hunter Tool Systems tools, there is a link in the description to 10% off your next order. Just use code INLAYGYM. Now, over the last month or so, I've covered a lot of topics uh, involving wood turning. And this, one, this week, I'll try and cover how long it takes to make a bowl or a hollow form. And, you know, this is not an easy question to answer. All I will say is that for this urn, there was seven hours of footage to edit. Now, some of that, of course, is kind of 
dead areas within within the video and some of it is moving around and setting up I typically don't shut the camera off every time. I, did, I just decide to edit that out. Um, so, you know, it, it's, and that's not including, you know, going and getting the wood and all these other things. So this urn in itself is, is you know, six hours worth of work. And, you know, this was kind of a deal that I worked out with Troy. He gave me some wood in exchange for, um, you know, three urns um yeah i guess it's just three urns and like i've said before those when when there's no money exchanged between your wood supplier and you that's that's great <laughs> because i mean it's it's not it's not a cheap thing to make and it's not an easy business to really get established in so you know um anytime that you can forego the monetary aspects and just trade pieces for wood that to me is a win-win so pieces like this, I'll say that in total, there's probably eight hours worth of turning and just kind of fooling around with this piece, going to get the, the wood, you know, all, all all the stuff that's involved from, you know, roughing it out and drying it and then finishing it and to its finished state. So, you know, if you base your shop rate on $80 an hour at eight hours, you're looking at $640 just in labor. That's not including, uh, you know, the resin, sandpaper, uh, power. So, you know, it, it is very, very easy for a turning or an urn such as this to, to hit the $1,000 mark or more. And, you know, a lot of people look at a, a small item like this and say, well, how can that cost that much money? And, you know, by the time you start paying for your power and you're paying for your resin and your maintenance on your equipment, sandpaper, I mean, you name it, it, it really can balloon on you quite, quite quickly. And that's why a lot of these artistic pieces are not an easy sell because it's typically a smaller market. Uh, here on YouTube, I'm allowed to be creative because I'm I want to bring creative content to you guys every week. So you know, I pretty much sell everything that I've made here so far, and um, and I'm not even going to talk about the artistic side of you know, say a wood turning that's made by a famous turner. What you know what that entails you know so i mean i don't even consider myself to even be in that category like a david ellsworth or or anybody like that so you know those pieces that they're creating are going to be even much higher in value so you know it, it's it's not <laughs> sometimes a lot of people are really uh shocked at the sticker price but you know it, it is what it is like i i've got to be able to to price things where i can keep the lights on in the shop and and live you know live my life so hopefully that kind of clears up a lot of things and and you know i i see i would see it at shows all the time people would come in into my booth and they'd pick up a bowl and they'd flip it over and and they'd look like this is 300 bucks or this is 400 bucks well yeah i mean you're 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 holding a a 14 inch walnut bowl that's got an inlay in the rim like you know I, i've got to charge for that because people typically are not giving away walnut you have to buy walnut and it's hard to swing a deal to, to get walnut i've managed to do it a bit with troy but you know it, it's just one of those things that you know you some people just don't really realize how expensive it is to actually create the things that we do here on a weekly basis So getting back to the turning, as you can see, I'm cutting in the foot right now. Uh, there was a little void down there. I was quite surprised to see that, but uh, it, I managed to turn it away. And of course, we determine which is top and which is bottom. Of course, I put, I made sure that when I did this casting, I put it top down. That way, I knew for sure that all of the voids would be filled on the first initial casting in case the resin dropped off like it did. So that's that's another thing to consider. If you're if you're going to mount a piece and you want it mounted a certain way, then it's important to make sure that that casting is actually down in the bottom of the bucket. That way you know for sure that things are going to actually um, work out the way that they're supposed to. I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, the Hercules seems to be cutting better now. And what I did was I rotated the cutter. 
So, you know, I just run my finger over the edge of it. And, you know, you, after a certain time frame, when you've used this long enough, you'll know that when the cutter is getting dull, it needs to be rotated. Uh, Mike from Hunter Tools, he said, yeah, you know, I, I said to him, I'm like, how do you recommend people do this? And he goes, I, I just recommend people spin the cutter after every turning session. And then that way, eventually, all the um, all the sides of the cutter will get used up. And then, of course, it uh, needs to be replaced after that. So that's kind of my idea on how much a wood turning costs and how I can justify it. By all means, please leave a comment down below uh, your experience. Uh, I know some wood turners that really stick by the formula that, you know, 60 to $80 an hour. And um, I mean, that's cheaper than getting your car fixed. <laughs> you, you look at it that way. And um, I, I don't know, like it's, it's uh, pricing is a very, very tough thing. And sometimes you have to take a loss on some pieces or, you know, may, maybe not so much a loss, but take, take a reduced commission on what you've made just to simply get it out the door. If you know what I mean, you know, I, I've said this before that, the best way to build your business and figure out what people really want is to do shows. The more shows you do, the more sales confidence you'll get. And you know, there's just, there's just no way to, to, to better your business than to talk to your customers face to face and get feedback. You cannot get that from an online business or at least I don't see it as being able to. So I've still got the little knob there, so I want to cut that off, just chisel that off, no big deal. I'm going to be taking that away. Still have the center on the top and right into the chalk, and this thing lined up perfectly afterwards. Hardly any run out at all on it, so that was great. So we're going to start taking out the center of this so that I can use the hollowing tool. I think that's a three-quarter inch uh, bit, and then I step it up to an inch and a half. I know that's a big jump, but it's typically what I do. Now, another common question that I get is, how come I don't ever use the resin shavings to make projects with? And there you can see me holding up some long ones there in the back. To be perfectly honest with you, I've seen some pieces made with them, and I do not like the look of them. Typically, there's a lot of air trapped in them, so that's another reason why, a lot of full of bubbles. But, you know, it is probably... It's, it's way up there on how many times I'm asked to do something with shavings, either resin or wood. So to satisfy the curious, we are going to, we'll make some stuff in the future involving shavings. But, you know, I, I just, I find they just give a real kind of dirty look and I'm typically not a fan of them. But we'll see. We are all set up for coring. As you can see, I've got the steady rest in. If you're new here, this is the one-way manufacturing captive system it has a laser right now i have the laser so that it's right on the tip so that i know where i am the plan is to go into the very base and then work my way out on this here just to clean off the bottom i'm hoping to just get away with this and this little extension that comes with the uh the boring bar itself definitely need um the steady rest up we're pretty far off of the headstock here, so um, bad things may happen. And of course, I've got my orb light set up from last week. All right, let's see how we make out. So when I do my hollow forms, I typically like to go in to the very bottom and establish the bottom. So, you know, after, after that drill bit comes out of there, there's going to be a point in there typically. So I usually try to get rid of that and then try to open up some space in the in the urn itself or the or the hollow form in the, in the cavity so that, you know, you don't have to shut the lathe off so many times uh, to clear the shavings away, which is kind of a real pain. But so that's typically what I do. And then after I get the bottom done, you'll see me come in and out of the urn, just trying to open up the cavity. And then that way, I, I know that a lot of people, that's probably not the way that they would do it. They would actually start at the top and whittle away all the way down into the base but just that initial start i really like to get in there and just kind of open up the overall cavity just so that i don't have to do that every 10 seconds 
So for the people that are thinking about doing this, uh, this professional wood turning thing, uh, you know, the one of the big pieces of advice that I can give them is you've got to be active on social media. And, you know, I'm probably not as active as I used to be when I was doing shows before COVID. I certainly would post on Instagram pretty much every day. Uh, that's kind of fallen to the wayside now. I'm so involved in filming. Uh, and, in, and if you're wondering, I typically have two projects on the go, sometimes three. I've even had up to four projects on the go at one time. So, so it's hard to, uh, probably the biggest problem with that is managing the footage, offloading the camera and make sure that all of these uh, clips get loaded into the right video at the end of the day. Because if you let that go for a day or two, then you're going to be in trouble because you can't remember what you did. So social media is important. I don't really know how big of a role it plays in my business, but you know, the more people that are out there sh uh, sharing my videos, of course, that has helped my account grow. So, you know, thank you to all the people that have done that. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm not on TikTok, even though some people say that I probably should be. Uh, I don't do Twitter. I don't see the point in that. And um, my website, if you've been to my website, you'll notice that it's it's out of date. I don't keep it up to date. I, I've got enough on my plate. I really do. And I, I just can't maintain my website. Basically, I've got about probably 10 bowls in my inventory that are probably pre-COVID. And that's about it. I don't really have a lot of time for any production work. And I still do some custom work as well on the side when I'm not shooting YouTube videos. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, I really want to bring you guys really good content every every week, and you know you've you got to kind of pick one or the other. So I, I really want to stick with YouTube, and as long as you guys are here supporting me, I will be here for you guys as well. I just want to point out that I'm putting that little extension in there, and I was able to use that for the rest of the urn, so that worked out fantastic. No bent bars or anything like that. And, the, you know, the great thing about that boring bar is it's very robust. So there's very little vibration out of it, where the smaller bars tend to vibrate a little more, especially the, the right angle ones. I think I talked about this last week, too. But uh, I, I just sharpened the cutter, and it is actually doing well. Every now and then, you'll see me stick my finger to make sure that nothing has moved. Because if the laser moves, and, you know, it's there is some vibration there and if you if you don't notice it then you could go right through the side of your project so it's important to check that regularly when you pull it out and clean out the shavings so we're getting close to our wall thickness and like i said in the past i typically try to stick around a half inch quarter quarter to a half inch is what I'm looking for. Uh, if you're sanding the inside, then of course you can lose a little bit of that. Uh, as you can see, I pulled up one of the wheels here. I panned out so that you can see what's going on. And that's because I wanted to be able to watch the laser and the wheel was impeding that from happening. This piece seemed to be holding very good, so I didn't really see it as a huge risk. One thing to keep in mind when you're trying to clamp down on these resin pieces or these pieces that are impregnated with with resin that it's very, very hard. And now when you go to close the jaws down on the chuck, it doesn't really typically bite into it like it would a just a normal piece of wood. So keep that in mind as well because it can easily come out of the jaws and you've seen it a couple times on my channel where the pieces come out of the jaws and that's just really because the jaws themselves can't really clamp down on it and get a good bite into it because the jaws for this is the one-way stronghold chuck they're actually serrated and even that has a real hard time getting in there and kind of squeezing that wood to hold it in place.
you'll see here in a second, so I'll, I'll put the hollowing rig in. You see me kind of move it back and forth. There was a little ridge in there. So what I do is I, I stick it in there and I feel for that ridge that needs to go and then basically hold it in place, just back it off just slightly so it's not actually rubbing on the surface of the wood. And then turn the lathe on and just try and feel your way. You know, you can't really look in these pieces. So really it, it's, a, it's a lot of feel and touch trying to get these smooth on the inside. It works out well for me here. Um, <laughs> here I am fooling with the bottom again. I was just like, what is going on here? And I kept raising and lowering the tool rest because I just had that little nub in the very bottom that just irritates the heck out of pretty much anybody that does these things. There, I'm looking for it. Nope, didn't get it yet. Need to move it around. Eventually, I get it. But uh, it is just slightly, uh, just very, very so slightly above center. And that seems to work the best for me to get rid of that little uh, nub that sticks in the bottom. I'm going to try and show you in here. Uh, you know, very happy. Cut very cleanly. No real complaints about that at all. I'm just going to mix up some resin and we will do a resin finish on the inside of this piece. Alright, I've got some art cast here and I'm just going to dump that down inside of the urn. And that will seal up anything that's down in there that may be questionable, but I tell you, it, it looks pretty solid. I'm actually very happy with it. I've actually warmed it up in some water and uh, that way it's nice and liquidy. So I'll just put this in here, swish it around, then I'll flip it upside down on this, leave it for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then flip it upright, and we'll be able to get, th get at this tomorrow. There, I'll leave that for about 10 minutes and then I'll bring you back in for what I'm going to do next before I leave for today. All right, so I had it upside down for about 10 minutes. It's been sitting like this for about five minutes now. And the last thing that I want to do is take the torch and just go down inside the form quickly and burn off any bubbles that are coming up. All right, so that's it. I'll let this sit overnight, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Now that our resin finish is done on the inside, I'm just using the Hercules here, just taking some really light passes, trying to get rid of any little bits of re remaining tear out and lumps and bumps, if you will. You will see me switch to the 5 8 bowl gouge, and that will be a freshly sharpened edge, and it's got that long wing. So I do find that the Hercules and those smaller cutters are a little tough for me to get a real nice curve on. So that's why I like to use the 5 8 bowl gouge on its side. But again, it's got to be freshly sharpened and it does a real good job just cleaning out the surface. And there you go. Like we're ready for sanding. Yeah, there's some little bits of lumps and bumps, but other than that, it's ready for sandpaper. Speaking of that, these are the three and a half inch dipple discs from sandpaper.ca. And again, there is a link in the description to 10% off your next order. I really like using these. I like the fact that they wrap around the edge of the sanding pad because you can use them right up where the, the neck on that urn is. And you can't typically do that with a lot of other sanding discs that don't have the, the dimples on the side that wrap around the edge. Give them a try, guarantee it, you will absolutely love these discs. Well, that's what it looks like after buffing and cleaning with the denatured alcohol. Looks pretty darn spectacular. All right, so I'm not gonna put any finish on this because I wanna be able to fit the lid to this uh, and then we'll put the finish on everything. 
So this is our lid. I just took it out of the little dish that it was sitting in, ground it down so that we're almost to the wood on this side. Uh, we already got a center here, so what I'm going to do is pinch this between centers. We'll turn a tenon that will fit the inside of the urn. We'll snap that on, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to just shape it while it's on the urn. I don't know. We'll see. I might grab it with a chuck too because uh, really this tenon is just, you know, once it goes in there, you're never going to see it again anyway, so it really doesn't matter if it's got some bite marks on it or not. Just want to pass on a thank you. Amy sent, sent me this. Uh, there was no need for that. Thank you very much, though. I certainly do appreciate it. I won't say her last name on here just in case she doesn't want that said, but I appreciate it. Thank you. I also want to point something out that a lot of people don't really know how to use one of these things. This here, of course, is a right angle, and if you've got a perfectly square piece, then this is what you would use. This this one here is typically used for round stuff. Okay, so that's the difference between the two if you're wondering why those are on there like that. So nothing hugely spectacular here, just getting rid of any excess resin. And then you'll see me in the next clip coming up, uh, use the parting tool, start cutting in the lid. I did miss it a little bit. I would have liked to have seen it um, be a little tighter, but uh, what I recommend people doing with the lids on my urns is to just use a fine bead of silicone and put that just around the tenon where it fits onto the urn and once that sets then you know what it's it's good so there's no worries there it's got a little slackness in it i think it's fine though i'm gonna put some finish on this just like on the outside so once I get some finish on here, uh, there might be some bite marks in it from the from the chuck holding it. And then I think that it'll probably fit in there probably really good. All right, so let's flip this around. We're actually, what I'm probably gonna do right now is mount this on the vacuum chuck, clean this off and sand that, and then we can grab it with the chuck and then we can finish the outside dimension wise. This is, too big I think it needs to be cut down not, not a whole lot more but uh, I definitely want to make it thinner on the top and just a little bit uh, smaller in diameter as well if you're curious after the coats went on the inside opening of the urn and underneath of the piece it did actually fit a lot tighter than uh, I just showed there in that previous clip as far as the lid is concerned, it was right in between the size from my small jaws and my larger jaws. <laughs> so I was forced to use the vacuum chuck. And of course, this is the great thing about a vacuum chuck. There's a little adapter that I made so that it holds smaller work. And you'll see me later on have to do this again for the urn body itself. So, you know, this is the great thing about these vacuum chucks. They work fantastic and I highly recommend getting one if you can swing the price on getting one. So we've got the lid flipped around and it's just being held by the stronghold again. And of course, we're just using the Hercules just to trim this thing back. Uh, it was, the lid is slightly domed. I was looking for, I didn't really want something flat. I figured just a slight dome would look nice. So that's why it's like that. And again, just, you can see that the Hercules tilted up in the air. That will avoid any catches that you have. There, I just brought the urn up to say, yeah, that's about the right size. So just some little final cuts and then on to sanding. And this piece was sanded. I think I started at 120 on this piece and went all the way to 800 like I did on the body.
now that the camera's running, I'm using triple E buffing compound from the BL buffing system to buff all the resin and the wood and then denatured alcohol prior to the first coat of finish. All right, so we are going to use the Waterlux Original Gloss again this week. Again, this is a, this should make it really come alive in a super shiny urn. There you go. Wow. Again, those those pearl pigments are just awesome. That burl is spectacular. The uh, the different areas where you've got resin staining and you don't really uh, add to it visually. A little bit of red right there. Because it's a that's a fungus that grows inside of box elder, which this is just beautiful. All right, I'll show you how I'll do the lid next. So the top has really been. Uh, saturated with the resin so you know geez one coat will probably do it but i'll put two on it just to be sure once i've got again this thing is so penetrated with resin that i don't think there's even really a need to do the inside of this but after i get the second coat on it i will flip it over and, and put a coat on by hand on the inside where the tenon is and um yeah i mean it's again it's a beautiful spectacular piece the burl of course, burl eyes, very, very cool. And that resin. Mm. All right, well, we will see you tomorrow for the second coat. Before we put the next coat of finish on, it's the next day. I thought that I would show this. As you can see, wherever this resin staining is, I mean, it is really covered nicely. Uh, the wood has absorbed a lot of the finish. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if two is going to do it or not. Might just put three on it anyway, but I mean, it looks pretty darn nice after one coat. So that's the base. Set this down. There's the lid. For all intents and purposes, you could probably get away with one coat because it's been saturated with the resin. guarantee you this will not move the uh the urn body itself may over time but i don't think so it's it's uh there's so much resin in it that i really don't think that's going to happen all right let's get our second coat on same as the first coat we use the the triple e buffing compound between all the coats and then this piece i used 40 steel wool in the opening of the urn because i couldn't get the buffer in there and then clean with denatured alcohol before the next coat finish. All right, so we're back again with the Waterlux Original Gloss. Well, there she is. Even the, uh, the areas without the resin staining have, looks like it's sitting on the surface, so I don't know, you never know. Now one thing, it's heavy to hold with uh, <laughs> three fingers, well two fingers and a thumb. But uh, she's a beauty, definitely. All right, so if there's a third coat, I will do it the same. Uh, let's do the lid, see what that looks like.
Well, not a huge change, that's for sure. Two coats will absolutely do it for this piece. Uh, probably what I'll do tomorrow is put uh, a coat underneath of this once I can handle it without putting my fingerprints all over it. But we will see you when we're doing the very bottom on the urn. Here I'm just turning a drive that's going to drive the urn so that we can finish the bottom. I figured that I would do that because most people don't have a vacuum chuck. So this is a way to do it. So it looks like two coats are going to do it. So let's get this uh, tenon turned off and get our bottom finished. If you're curious, I'm just pointing out that there that the center is still there. That way, when the urn goes back onto the lathe, everything should be still running relatively true. And I just stuck with the 5 8 bowl gouge to do the majority of the whittling away of the of the tendon here. Even though it's got resin in it, it's still turned away actually quite nicely. Uh, be careful not to go up the edge of your urn here. That would not be good. So you use, you'll see me use four tools. That was the 5 8 bowl gouge. Then I'm coming in here with the 3 16 parting tool. That's a scoochy gouge. I've used um, quite a bit in the um, my pepper mill videos that I've made. And then the very last thing is I have a very thin parting tool. You'll see me use that after I've sanded away the base here. There it is there. And I probably could have just snapped that little piece off, but I decided to get my, you can see there's not very much of it there. I decided to get my little chisel and just pop it off. Now this is probably the most common way that people would finish the bottom of these urns as far as sanding is concerned. And what you'll see is once I get done here, I'll go over and I engrave this piece because it was so dark. I don't think that my writing would have showed up on it. Then I put it back onto the vacuum chuck and didn't I touch the outside in the urn. So there you go. Now you gotta <laughs> you gotta buff off the finish and redo it. So there's a lesson for all there. Just be very careful when you're sanding the very base that you don't end up touching any of the sides of your urn or your bowl because if you don't, you're gonna have to refinish it all. So I did the bottom side first and then flipped it around, did the top side, and my solution to this is just to make this little adapter plate and that goes into the vacuum chuck itself and the little neoprene seal area is small enough that there's still edges of the urn showing at the very bottom so that way we could actually put a coat of finish on this and be reasonably safe with it you can see me kind of holding it in place when i was uh, cleaning it with denatured alcohol but uh, as long as you're not don't push on it too hard It'll work just fine. There you go. I figure that we should have a coat of finish under the lid as well. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, this is going to be the only coat that I'm going to put on it because I really don't think that it needs anything more than this. There you go. Nice and easy. All right, so let's have a last little look at this beautiful little urn. You know, the more that I work in black, the more I'm liking it. And again, I'm sorry about the reflection, but with the gloss finish on here, this thing is just super, super shiny. I'll put some uh, rotating pictures up at the end like I usually do. Uh, here is the very bottom. There is no finish on there yet. Uh, that sandpaper hitting the side of the urn yesterday kind of threw that up. <laughs> threw that away so I had to do another finish and um, another coat of finish anyway it is just absolutely super shiny and I'm really kind of in love with, with this uh, the, the black is you know I when I first started doing resin I was like I kind of stayed away from it because it just re really wasn't my thing but the more I work with it the more I'm really liking it uh, there's the other side of the lid and again it's got so much resin in it that one coat is fine for that 
and here's the very top again I'm trying to do this so it's not so shiny so you can see the urn itself ended up being um, seven and a half inches tall and six inches wide I never bothered measuring the the, the volume on this because this is one of three urns that I'm making for Troy and his family. So, you know, there's there's not really a, a worry about having enough space in there. But I will try and link a um, calculator down in the description if you're curious how to make urns uh, volume-wise. Anyway, it's um, this box holder burl. Just a little bit of red right here. It's hard to... Hard to believe because a lot of this box of Liberal had a lot of red in it, but this piece in particular doesn't seem to. Uh, anyway, it is it is hefty. Uh, I don't have a scale here to measure it. Or actually, hold on a sec. I think I might have. So the weight on this piece is actually two pounds, 10 ounces. And if you've worked with box elder or Manitoba maples, what we like to call it here in Canada, it's very, very light. So that, that gives you an idea how much resin has penetrated this piece and essentially stabilized it. Uh, anyway, let me know in the comments what you think down below. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful urn. Uh, the, the, the resin, the pearl effect, and again, I'm trying to, it's so shiny, sorry. Maybe at the end with the rotating photos, you'll be able to see the, the pearl in there, but it's, it's really, really spectacular as well. Um, never did show down inside. If we're going to be able to, I don't know. It's down inside. You can't really see too much. And, uh, of course, the bottom, well. No finish on the very bottom because I screwed up and hit the side of this with 600 grit uh, yesterday. So, when you're sanding your bottoms, make sure you're careful that... That, that doesn't happen because it really it kind of threw me off a day when you're working with these shiny finishes that's just kind of how you what you end up with all right well that's it for the video let me know down in the comments what you think about this week's video and of course we're going to pick from the comments for the 70,000 subscriber giveaway bowl and on top of that designer epoxy is going to give away a three gallon kit so all we ask is that you put designer epoxy down in the comments and you'll be entered for that draw when I do the 70,000 subscriber giveaway bowl when I hit 70,000. All right, uh, so next week, <laughs> we're gonna be revisiting the Peacock hollow form. Things been really bothering me, so I've gotta get it off my mind. So right now it's, it's in progress and hopefully it works this time, but we'll, you'll have to come back and find out. <laughs> I guess when you look at the thumbnail next week, you'll know if it probably worked or not. But anyway, that's it. Until next week, take care, stay safe. Don't forget that bell. Please share my videos with your friends. See you next week.